Hi, my name is Jill Kinzer, and welcome to our office on this beautiful day in Seattle. I'm excited to share with you a little bit about the microscope today. I'm going to focus on the anatomy and the mechanics, and this would be helpful information if you're thinking about buying a microscope and you wanna know what questions you might wanna ask. It would also be helpful if you have a microscope and just understanding more about the me mechanics and the anatomy of it and the functional pieces. So let's dive in. The microscope is actually called a stereoscope, and what that means is that it allows us to view our operating field in three dimension. Anytime that we are looking through uh, two, with two eyepieces through one objective lens, this is stereo vision. And if you think of the alternative to that, it would be what you'd use in a lab, looking at a slide on a lab bench. Um, that is a flat plane microscope. So let's focus first on the binoculars and this concept of stereo vision. Uh, the binoculars are actually like two telescopes or two microscopes. They each have lens and they have a set of prisms in them that allow you to view down in, in through one objective lens. And these prisms actually orient the image and bring them so that what you see coming through here in, in your eyepieces is actually upright and oriented correctly um, relative to what you're seeing. So this binocular complex has a couple of adjustable pieces on it. The first would be just something simple like this that allows you to sit upright in, an, in a position that is ergonomically correct. The second, which is this on top, is called a PD knob or an interpupillary distance knob here. And these are different on different types of scopes. Sometimes it's not actually a dial. Sometimes it's actually just the ability to move the two eyepieces in and out but often there will be a marker or a dial on it where you can actually record and remember where your interpupillary distance is so that you can keep track of it. If, if This would be helpful if you have more than one operator using the microscope. All right, let's talk about the eyepieces. Each of these has a lens in them. On this scope, it's a 12.5. The number is usually on the side of the scope here. These can go anywhere from a 10 to a 20, uh, and, and that is a fixed lens. On top of each of these, you can see these little hash marks and this plus and minus. These are the diopter adjustments and they go from a negative eight all the way up to a plus five. And these are dialed for anybody who needs some correct, corrective uh, refraction in their vision. For like somebody who has perfect vision, they would have both of these set at zero. I, on the other hand, have one eye that is just slightly different, so I would adjust this eyepiece on the left to fit my prescriptions, which is a, a 1.25 on my left eye. Um, another thing that these have is these little eye cups. And so for me, because I'm not using eyeglasses when I'm looking through the scope and using it, I would have these dialed all the way out. And what this does is it improves your field of view. So for somebody who is going to wear their corrective vision, their corrective lenses while they're using the microscope, which you certainly can. Um, you're going to dial these all the way back in so you have some room for your lenses, and then you would dial these to zero because your corrective vision is coming from your, your glasses, not from the scope itself. The other thing about this binocular piece is you'll notice right here below this interpupillary distance knob, there's a number. It says F170. And I've read some information on this that has referred to it as a f-stop on a camera, that, it, that it's, it tells you how much light is coming through these tubes. But really this f number is actually your lens length. So 170 is the focal length of the lens in this complex here. All right, we're gonna go ahead down to the main body of the scope. This is the second big section here. And we're going to look at this part. It's a dial on the side and it's called a magnification changer. And it, this scope has six different steps on it, five different magnifications. And if you look closely, there's a number on there. And it's not, these numbers are a factor of the magnification, the true magnification. Um, they're actually, they're, it's not like four times, eight times, 12 times. It's a calculation that I will go through in a different, different video in, in terms of how to record that and how to measure that. Uh, but that's how you change your magnification and step it up. Essentially, there is a series of lenses on the inside of this scope body on a turret that um, as you're turning this knob, it's rotating that and rotating the lenses so that you can change that magnification step. Many scopes today, um, this is motorized and this can just be done by using a foot switch. 
Okay, we are going to go down now to probably the most important part of the scope, and this is your objective lens here. And the reason it's called an objective lens is because it's closest to the object that you're working on. So this one, you can see the numbers there. It goes from a 200 all the way up to a 400. And there's either a single lens or a series of lens in here, depending on the scope, that is actually has moving parts. So as that lens is, as we're rotating it and the lens is moving, it's allowing us to change that focal length of the lens. And what this is, is, you know, this is basically your working distance from the operating field. So for somebody who is shorter, they're going to have a shorter torso, shorter working length, and they're gonna have this number a lot lower. Whereas somebody with a longer torso, like my husband, he is he is going to wanna to sit a little bit farther away from the patient and from the operating field, and so he may have that dialed up to a 300 even, potentially. Uh, I, w I do notice that personally, when I am working in a patient's mouth that my, often my working distance is shorter, whereas if I am outside of the patient's mouth, I may actually bring my hands a little bit farther away from the lens and dial this out a little bit just to give me a little more space uh, with dust and drilling, like maybe trimming a temporary, that, that sort of thing. Another thing that this is really great for is it is also a fine focus. And if you are, as you go to higher magnifications, one thing that you notice is that your depth of field really shrinks. So at the highest magnification, you may only be able to see five, six millimeters uh, um, in terms of depth. Whereas at a lower magnification, you may have 18 millimeters of depth. So if I'm working in a patient's mouth and I need to see uh, maybe, uh, let's think of like the facial surface on number eight and I wanna see the palatal surface on number eight, uh, this would be a really quick, easy adjustment that I would just dial my, my focal length back a little bit and be able to see the palatal side of the tooth without actually having to move the whole camera body and the scope around. To, so it's just a really handy, easy, quick, quick adjustment that you can make. Okay, let's go on now to the uh, light source. So we're gonna turn this on here. Um, the light source is actually mounted either on a base, like a, a floor stand base or a ceiling mount in a separate compartment. And you probably can hear it going now. There's a fan that's uh, meant to cool that and some of the mechanics in there as well. But uh, it comes down to the suspension rod here and it enters on a fiber optic cable right through the back of the scope here, right into the mid body. And this, this light source has, there are some prisms which direct it straight down through the objective lens into our field. And this is wonderful. It's, it's called coaxial or cofocal light source. And what that means is it, it basically floods the field so that you do not get any shadows while you are working. Um, it's just really handy and bright light source. Uh, this, this high intensity light source is an LED and that's pretty much the standard today in dentistry. A lot of scopes um, over the years have been have had halide and halogen and xenon and the challenge with them is that they, the bulbs burn out too quickly and you have to replace them frequently. So the, this is a really great advancement in more recent years with microscope dentistry. Um, the intensity usually can be adjusted. On this scope here, there's a dial right in the middle and you can dial it up or down to decrease that, that intensity if, if you need to. Um, I find this is really handy when I when I first purchase a scope and getting and I'm getting used to the light source. Um, every once in a while, maybe I want to dial it down. It's just too bright for what I'm working on, but but you can make a slight modification with that dial and change it there. Um, it also has all sorts of filters on it. Um, You'll, you'll find most microscopes that are used in dentistry have an orange filter, and that is for all the light sensitive materials that we use. This allows me to work on the patient uh, with composite and doing bonding procedures without worrying about the materials prematurely curing or setting. It, this scope in particular, actually, this is the Xtero 300 by Zeiss, and I haven't really seen this on other scopes, but 
this this scope does have a uh, what's called true light and what that is is it, it is a filter still that does help protect your procedures for that are light sensitive but you do not have the orange color that that shows up and and this is really handy if you're doing composite and shade matching and you want to see what's happening to the core color of the tooth or the materials as you're placing them it's very helpful it's also great if you're documenting if you're doing any photography under the scope or um, documentation that you want to get images that are of placing the composite and placing them in these materials without having the dark the the orange filter uh, which can interfere with that this scope also has a green filter and i don't know that you can see the color very well through this uh this this video but that is essentially for uh any time anybody who's working with a laser so this green filter is just to help protect your eyes during those procedures uh, another nice feature about this scope in particular is it does have options of fluorescent mode, which allows for caries detection. Not all microscopes have that. That is kind of a great feature if you want to use that fluorescent mode for caries detection. I didn't have this installed on this one. Uh, so, so that's pretty much sums up, that sums up the light source. Okay, so let's go ahead and turn the light source off and let's talk about components now here. Microscopes have a lot of different options for adapters and components and things that you can add to them to really personalize it for your needs. One, of, one that's really handy that you will see on a lot of microscopes is called the Mora adapter. And it fits in this midsection here between the binoculars and the body. And what it allows is for this binocular section to remain upright and straight while the lower body will actually swivel back to the right and to the left. And if you can imagine, this is, this is very helpful if you need to get to different parts of the mouth and, and don't want to compromise your ergonomics. Uh, this scope does not have a more adapter, and the reason why is that I have what's called a beam splitter, and this, this scope did not allow for me to have both. Uh, a beam splitter does essentially what it sounds like. It splits the beam. It splits the image coming up through the objective lens to the binoculars and to some other place. Uh, in this scope, I have it going over here to a, an adapter that allows me to capture images for documentation. So there's all sorts of options on this, and I'm not going to go into it on this on this video at all. But um, there there's all different options. Usually, the beam splitter and the adapters are all specific to the microscope and then to the camera that you're using. And so that's something that we could spend a lot of time on. The other reason that you would use a beam splitter is so that you could attach a second set of binoculars off on this side. This would be for the assistant. So assisted side binoculars, they add a little more weight to the camera and to the, I mean, to the scope, but they're very handy. They allow the assistant to see exactly what the operator is seeing through the objective lens. And this is great for endodontics, uh, any, any fine little procedures on a very high magnification with not a lot of movement of the scope, uh, you, can, you can imagine that that allows the, the assistant to be prepared and actually hand instruments over and, and to support the procedure a little bit more. Uh, other than that, I think I covered everything. So I hope that you've learned something from this and uh, thank you very much for your time. If you have any questions, please feel free to reach out to me.